That's great. Thank you, young men. Those are terrific guys there. If you have Acts chapter 13 in your Bible, we'll be there for the whole message, except for, I want to read one verse out of Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, second book of your Bible, you can find that, the book of the Acts, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, and that is uh, the fifth book of your New Testament will be there, the rest of the message, but we're going to start out in Exodus chapter 3, and I uh, want to encourage you to be faithful, uh, be faithful to God privately, personally, between you and the Lord, you matter, um, uh, your, your life matters, your testimony matters, you'll see in the, we get into Acts chapter 13, uh, some things that uh, go along with the Sunday school lesson we had this morning. All right, Acts chapter 3, let's stand for just a moment, and if you're going to need to slip out now, it'd be a good time, then have a seat in the back and not be a distraction to people. I want to bring you into the story of Moses. He's up on the mountain, 40 years he's been in the wilderness as a shepherd. At uh, 40 years old, he left Egypt, now he's 80, he's... Uh, He's just ready to get started. So some of you that are 80, just ready to get started. And uh, verse 1, I'm going to skip a couple of these verses. Verse 7 is the text. But verse 1, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the, pre the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. He said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thy standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Our text is verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Father, help us today as we look at this eternal and incredible book. Thank you for all that it says. The passages that are hard for us to have any understanding of, the passages that seems to dry that we're in our old flesh gets bored but we thank you for the comfort and the encouragement of it we ask you to do that today and be a help to your people we pray in jesus name amen you can be seated i'd like to mention in verse seven as a springboard to the message this morning he says in verse seven the lord said i have surely seen the affliction of my people. Um, this year has been a hard for a lot of people. We've had funerals that people weren't allowed to attend and weddings on, you know, piers and backyards. And, and um, we've had people die in the hospital without their loved ones able to visit them. <coughs> we've had young people's whole worlds turned upside down and it's not the end of the world, but college graduations and high school graduations tossed to the wind as if young people's dreams didn't matter. And um, we've had a, a whole year of, of pressure and uh, unusual difficulties. We've had businesses fold. Uh, we've had people who, whose their whole career, their whole future, and I don't know any personally, but you know in a country as big as ours, there are people who whose senior year of high school or college made the difference of a pro contract or a college scholarship. And that's all gone. And um, it's, it's a difficult thing to, for me to get the phone call from the, the uh, adult daughter who says my mom is dying and they won't let me in to see her. And uh, this world is not our home. This world's not our friend. We've been blessed economically. We've been blessed materially in our nation, and we have been we've been spoiled. But uh, but this don't think this world's your friend. This world has been uh, your enemy. It's been a subtle enemy, like the boa constrictor, who uh, you know you raise it up and you think it's friendly, and one day it gets around your neck, you know. And if you don't carry a pocket knife for a thirty-eight, you're in trouble. Um, but um, God says in verse 7, 
of Exodus 3, I've surely seen the affliction of my people. Don't think God didn't know. Now, just that God doesn't act when we want him to act doesn't mean he doesn't know. And he goes on. He, he said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. Of course, Egypt's a picture of the world. And we're in this world. We're stuck in this world. And he sees the awkward and the difficult. And I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Allison de Moville will be getting married. I, and I blanked the date. I've got it written down. But February or March or April of uh, this year. And, and our parents in the Philippines are not right now are not going to be able to come to the wedding. And it's not the end of the world. But you know what? It's a, it's a big deal. And uh, if they, they might be able to get out of the Philippines, but then they won't be able to get back in. And maybe the things will change in a couple of months. But, but, um, but we're in this world. Um, work has been awkward or it's been overworked. You've run night and day. And, and he says, I've seen. You're in this world. And he said, I, I see you in this world. I understand it's where you live. And I understand the unusual circumstances you're in. But he goes on in the middle of verse 7. And he says, I'm, and, and, or, and I, I put in the word I, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. And, and uh, you know, we've had some people climbing our frame. And we're in a pretty conservative town. I hope you realize we're, we're pretty spoiled here. Um, I've, I've on purpose found restaurants that let you dine in and gone there. Even if I'm taking it out, I'm still going to spend money on people who are willing to say, we're Americans and we're free. If you're worried about your health, stay home. Uh, if you're worried about your health, uh, please take care of your health. But don't make me lose my life, okay? We've never done that in the history of America. Uh, not for eight months we haven't, and this isn't, isn't going away soon, especially depending on what happens with the president. But again, God sees. God's, God sees the affliction, and he, he knows where we are. He says there, I have, uh, I have heard their cry by reason of the taskmasters, and we've got this government over us, and realize this, we're not being fed to lions, we're not being burned at the stake, we're not being buried alive, we're not being tied hand and foot and thrown in the river and drowned uh, like millions and millions of, of our spiritual fathers were and their families throughout the dark ages. So, but, but I hope all of you, especially you young people, I hope you understand that tyranny has no problem destroying churches, Bibles, and believers. Tyranny has got, you let the, the political left in California have anything they want, there would never again be a church open, never a private school, never a Bible. There would absolutely be no way of anything spiritual or patriotic in America, in California again. And that's our people who are in office right now. They are only being held back by the chains of the Constitution and the Spirit of God. Because by the grace of God, by the mercy, uh, let's just hold it down just a little back in the back, okay? Uh, they came to hear me, not you, brother. God bless you. Um, and I'm not against amens. I'm against shows. Um, I'm for amens. But uh, we have in our country, uh, we've had, um, we've had a, a, a nation of tyranny creeping up. And you're the answer. You're the ones who are holding this back. And please don't be quiet the rest of the service, all right? <laughs> I'm not going to climb all over you, and I am nice. Roy's my friend. Um, but uh, relax, okay? Amen? Yeah. All right, good. Just relax a little bit. But this country, the hope of America, I like our president, and I like some of the people in D.C., but they're not the hope. The hope is the people in this room. And in churches across America, the hope is the God of this book, and the God who sees your affliction and who hears your cry. Look at that next line in verse 7. I have uh, seen their affliction. I have heard their cry. And look at the last line in verse 7. For I know their sorrow. And some of you have carried some things because we're big boys and big girls and we don't say anything. But, but you've hurt in your heart and you've carried some burdens and, and you've had the, the, uh, the invisible tears or the private tears. And, and you've gone through some things. But I'll tell you this, God knows your sorrow. You don't have a God who's far off. You have a God who's near. You have a God who knows your loneliness and knows your, your I don't get it. And there's a God in heaven who knows the hurt inside when you're sitting there thinking, why is this happening in my life or to my children or to my parents? And why my business? And look, God knows all that stuff. You know, I, I'd like to ask, 
why the, the Bezoses of this world are making way more money than ever while the Angelo's pizza place is struggling to pay his salaries. That bothers me. But this world's not our home. It is Bezos' home. And one day I'm going to be the billionaire. And we don't know where he's going to be. But if he doesn't get saved, he's going he's gonna to burn with all of his billions. And I don't say that gladly. I'd much rather him get saved and tithe to our church. <laughs> I'd rather him tithe to any old church. <laughs> his tithe would ruin all of us. We'd be so carnal if we had that money. Don't even want it. But if you want to mark your Bible, I'd circle three words. He's seen, he's heard, and he knows. Those are good words. And for you that this day or this year have carried an unusual load he sees and he hears and he knows he's not far and he doesn't care look over to acts chapter 13 this being missions month i want to use that thought to bring us to the first missionaries sent out of a church now jonah was sort of a missionary uh, not preaching the gospel of salvation by faith, obviously. He went to Nineveh and said, you don't repent, God's going to burn your hide. And that's not quite what Paul the apostle preached when he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shalt be saved. But we've got the church going, and, and uh, we're in Acts chapter 13, and Paul has been saved. He was Saul of Tarshish, an evil man, killing Christians. And isn't it great? God can, God can save sinners. I love that God saves sinners. Don't ever, we are, come back tonight. I may deal with that, but we're, we're so quick to crucify somebody because they got a weakness we don't have. And you might find out if you looked in the mirror about three seconds, you've got a couple of your own problems. But Acts chapter 13, our Sunday school lesson covered these first few verses. I'm just going to mention it. That verse 1, there was a church in, that was in Antioch. Antioch is a Gentile church over on the, the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean. It's west of, of Israel, west of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 12, Peter's in jail in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 13, um, Barnabas and Paul and others are in a prayer meeting in Antioch, a Gentile city. And uh, it says there were in the church, it was in Antioch. This is where they were first called Christians, by the way. Uh, in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. So we've got a group of preachers together. Uh, that, not preachers like pastors, but a bunch of the guys who were Bible teach, people who knew the word of God, leaders in the church. Barnabas and Simon is called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Maonim, and they, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And so they got this group of people. Look at verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. This was our lesson in adult Sunday school. I think most of you got that. But just in case, so quickly say a word or two. They ministered to the Lord. Do you understand when a group of people get together to pray, you are ministering to God? I mean, ministering to God like... You're a nurse taking care of somebody in a room, like your spouse broke a leg and you're taking care of their needs. We don't think that God needs us to minister to him, but the fact is a group of people gathering together for praise, prayer, worship, those people ministered to the Lord. Prayer meetings matter. And we've, and we've, we've just, like I said, just about lost it in America, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel guilty. What you do is up to you. What I do is up to me. I want to make you feel guilty. <laughs> All right, let's go on. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Lord, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work of unto I unto have called him. So verse 2, and again, I'm hurrying this. If you weren't in adult Sunday school, we taught these verses. They, the Spirit of God spoke to the people in that prayer meeting and called out Barnabas and Saul and, and said, Go out and preach the gospel. All right? And they were called. So verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed. So they'd been praying and fasting, and now they'd fasted and prayed some more. It could have been another hour. It could have been another two hours. We don't know. There's a group of guys together at church, and they're, they're in prayer together, and they're fasting. And again, it might have been a, an afternoon together. No telling what it was. He didn't say. But the Spirit of God says, I'd like these two to go preach. And so they take some more time to pray and fast. They lay hands on them, pray for them, and send them out to preach the gospel. And so, verse 4, so they, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, that's our Sunday school lesson was Acts 12, the prayer meeting that got Peter out of jail, and Acts 13, the prayer meeting that got the first two missionaries sent out to the world. Where would we be had these men not been sent out to preach the gospel? Where would we be had there not been a prayer meeting, a group of people who gathered together to pray? 
Could I make you feel really uncomfortable? Men, why are you embarrassed to open your mouth and pray around other people? And I mean men. I'm not picking on you. I'm just asking a rhetorical question. I'm, I mean, I'm going to let you squirm a little bit. America's in trouble, folks, because we've given the devil this country. Because our churches are cute little concerts with cute little Bible studies to cute little Christians who live very little cute Christian lives. And we don't pray. And I don't mean no one prays, but look at the prayer meetings of America. I was talking to a pastor at a church of I don't know, several thousand, way, way, way bigger than our church. He said, yeah, we might have a dozen, maybe 20 show up for prayer. You want to know why young men and young ladies aren't being called to the ministry? Maybe no one's praying. Uh, you want to know why our nation is in bondage? Maybe no one's praying. Maybe we're more consider concerned about how our kids can shoot a ball or jump a skateboard or make money or get a... A, uh, a sophisticated college degree to get a big income. Maybe we're more concerned about that than we are our kids being in Sunday school getting saved. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a spiritual, welcome to 2021. Uh, we've got a spiritual a vacuum in America. We have lost a, a heart. And I don't mean you. I mean as a whole, as a nation, we've lost a heart for God in this country. You know, somebody did the numbers. I don't know if it's true, but they say that America spends more on dog food than we do on foreign missions. Next time you buy dog food, just think about it. What do you put in the offering plate for missions, and what do you put in the dog's food plate? Come on. Put, the food, put the dog in the food plate, okay? <laughs> Stir fry him. Walk your dog. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Just joking. Animal lovers are going to kill me. Don't do that, all right? Don't read Becky. <laughs> Don't read Becky Martin's book, To Cross the Widest Ocean, where she brought her favorite dog and it disappeared. But anyway, them dear Filipinas, all right? But anyhow. <laughs> uh, now, walk with me through the first missionary journey. Here's some people who tried to serve God. We're just going to walk through the next few verses real quick, and then we're going to go have lunch because I didn't get breakfast, all right? And I didn't get a donut. Johnny Marino offered me one, but it was too late. So... They get in a boat and they take off. Now, we're just, just follow me through. If, you're not, if you don't have a Bible, we're in Acts 13. Look at it when you get a chance. Look at verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister, John Mark. He's the one whose mom's house the prayer meeting was at in chapter 12. Isn't it interesting that the young man who grew up in a home where there was prayer is the young man who joined Paul and Barnabas to preach? I wonder if there's any coincidence there or if it might have been connected that prayer and preaching the gospel go hand in hand. Maybe a young man who grew up hearing his mom and dad praying and hearing others around him praying, just maybe that young man said, I think this stuff is big. I think this stuff matters. Verse 5. When they were at Salamis, they, they preached the word. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 6. And when they had gone through to the, the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew named, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, you're going to go serving God. You know who you're going to find? The devil. You decide to live 2021 for God, the devil's going to show up. I don't care. You say, I'm going to raise these kids for God. The devil's going to show up. Decide you're going to have a Christian home. The devil's going to show up. Decide you're going to, whatever, teach a Sunday school class. Read your Bible every day, whatever. The devil's going to show up. He's there. And so they meet this sorcerer. Those are, sorcerers are real things. Don't play with witchcraft. Don't play with demonic stuff. Shut the televisions off. Shut off, sh shut off most of the conservative news. It's probably demonic. But I don't know. I have no idea. But I know there's a lot of devil stuff in this world. We ought to be very guarded about it. And keep our distance, young people. Don't be stupid, all right? Um, verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country. So we got this Sergius Paulus. Maybe he's a governor, mayor, whatever you want to call him. And he was, verse 7, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul. Now, understand this. There's some very good people who get working with some very bad people. So we've got a sorcerer who's the sidekick for a guy who's very prudent, and he wants Paul and Barnabas to come. This is a, a good man with some bad people around him. Don't get, 
don't crucify people because someone near them happens to not be godly. Remember David? The whole crew down at Ziglag, they lost everything and, and they have to go get it all back. And in the middle of the journey, they, God describes a whole section of his, his soldiers as men of Belial, demonic men. Now, these are guys who left their home and family to, to stay with, with David. And, and there's some bad people get around good people. And sometimes they're bad for a little while. Sometimes they're always bad. But let's, let's be good to people. Give them, a, give them a little bit of grace. So we've got this good guy, Sergius Paulus, with this, this sorcerer, Bargesus. And um, at, at the end of verse 7, this Sergius Paulus, he wanted to hear the word of God. Verse 8, but Elias uh, Elimus, which was the sorcerer, we just figured out his name, now he changed his name, isn't that something? But anyway, the sorcerer, for so his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And so here you've got Paul and Barnabas, they're called by the governor, and he's got this guy working with him, who's this sorcerer, and the guy, the guy in charge says, I want to hear the word of God, and this guy's trying to convince him not to listen. Don't be surprised if, as you seek to know God, there's people trying to drag you away. By the way, they can be very good looking. She could be the prettiest girl around. Be very careful. Plenty of pretty girls drug guys away from God. Plenty, plenty of handsome guys with money have drug girls away from, from God. Just be very much on guard. Use your head and uh, be, just understand there's, a, there's an evil world out there. And so Paul comes along. Don't, don't be surprised evil comes along, right? Let's, let's, then Paul shows up. I love verse 9. Then Paul, Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. That sounds just like a sermon you get from Joel Osteen, doesn't it? I mean, this warm and fuzzy, and uh, that's the purpose-driven life. <laughs> right there from whatever that guy's name is over the mountain from us. Look at the word. This is, he's, this is he's saying it to the guy's face in front of his co-worker. O full, verse 10, of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. Don't you think your parents are being mean when they say, I don't, I don't care for that friend. They're being nice. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord shall be upon you, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun. And immediately the guy was blinded, and he couldn't see anymore. And the governor said, I'd like to hear more about this. <laughs> so we're following the story. They get, they're at a prayer meeting. They get called to preach. They get out uh, preaching the gospel first thing. The devil shows up, and, and uh, there's a spiritual battle going on. No different than what we've got in America, what you've got in your job. The battle is raging. We are surrounded. We wrestle not, Ephesians says, against flesh and blood. That person's not your enemy. There's spiritual wickedness in high places. And this destroy people mentality is so carnal. I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. Apostle Paul probably got defriended for that sermon there. Uh, everybody quit following him on Instagram. Let's go down to verse 12. When the deputy saw what was done, he believed. And <laughs> that's something. Hey, he got saved. That guy said, you know what? I think you've got the word of truth right there. Being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Verse 13. Now Paul and his company loose from Paphos. They just kept on going. All right, let's get, look on. They came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, John was the young man, the kid, and uh, he saw a demonic interchange going on, and he saw a battle of spiritual darkness, and a guy turns blind, and the governor turns to Christ, and he's kind of shaken. If you've never had any exposure to anything demonic, you don't even know how intimidating internally it can be. Creepy is not the word. Absolutely spiritual darkness, and... And uh, don't look down on John Mark. I've heard people preached on John Mark the quitter. <laughs> Wait till you're there, pal. Uh, you don't know the battles that are raging. And uh, so they get there in Pamphylia. And um, the end of verse 13, John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. He said, you know, I, I think I'm going to go back and work with James and those guys back at the church in, in Jerusalem. And so you know what happens is sometimes when you're busy for God, you're going to lose some friends. 
And it doesn't mean they're bad friends. Sometimes people are going to part company. You'll, by the way, you follow him to the book of Timothy, and you'll find John Mark was the one who carried one of Paul's letters from prison all the way to Babylon. John Mark became a very trusted missionary later. He needed a little more time to get a grip on some things, and he went right back on serving God. And uh, that, there again, be very, very gracious to people. And uh, there's some people that really matter to God that have been, uh, John Mark being one of them, that really struggled. We go on a little bit further. Verse 15, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14, and they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia. Now there was an Antioch on the shore, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean near Israel, then there's Antioch, Pisidia, and that's up in Asia Minor. Uh, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and they, so they had to take a ship across the Mediterranean, and they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. After reading the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say on. Then Paul stood up. Now, this would be a situation where it was obvious for me to ask Brother Jose back here, pastoring 41 years in the Philippines, for me to ask him to come up. Did you, I think he taught, you did the lesson in the Filipino class today, Brother? So to ask him to preach, that's what, it's, it's somebody with a reputation, somebody with a, 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 a I don't know, a, a references, you might say. So Paul and Barnabas show up, and they knew who the, who the, the uh, Pharisees were. They knew who the Sadducees, the religious leaders were. And though he's a long ways from home, Paul, whether it be his dress or his demeanor or his introduction, whatever it was, Paul was somebody. And so the scriptures are read, and these guys being well-known preachers, um, they said, you, you want to add anything to this? And, and they gave him a chance. And so Paul, being a Baptist, amen. All right, I don't know. Uh, verse 16, Paul stood up beckoning with his hand and said, Men of Israel, uh, ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people chose our fathers. Now he goes through a, a lengthy sermon on the gospel. He is trying to convince these people to change their religion. We won't read through the whole thing. Go down to verse 25. He's gotten through the gospel from Moses all the way to verse 25, the, the, the John the Baptist. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, the children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. And he goes on preaching Jesus. In verse 28, he talks about Pilate having him crucified. Verse 30, But God raised him from the dead. So the apostle Paul comes along and says, your religion is really nice, but you need to get saved. That's what missionaries do. And you're in a culture today in America where we're being told, hey, it's not your job to meddle with anybody's religion. You probably read about it last year, maybe a year and a half ago. There's an island uh, in the Indian Ocean that, the, that was so primitive the government had made it against the law to even go to that island to protect its heritage like a, like a bird sanctuary and, and left them with their primitive medicine, their primitive uh, witchcraft, their primitive uh, lifestyle, their diseases without any modern influence that could help them. And so we shouldn't mess these people. And, and a young man had, had heard of that island and tried getting there once and was kicked out. He just wanted to get the gospel to them. And he went back again. He told his family and friends. He said, if I die, I'm going to die getting the gospel to these people. And he got there and they killed him. And some would say, what business is it of his to go mess with these people? Well, it, was, uh, it wasn't his business. It was God's business. Like Jesus said at 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. And you know what God's called you and me to do is to do the business of our Heavenly Father. And it doesn't matter what your career is. Where you get your paycheck is irrelevant. But what you do in the business of God is what matters. And so a missionary goes across the world. And then other Christians would say he wasted his life. Here he died. And he could have been given the gospel out in other places that welcomed him. Somebody's got to care. Somebody's got to go where no one will go. Someone's got to go where they're not wanted. Some of you were here a few years ago. We had a guy named Raji. Never got his last name because he's wanted. And he's been in, he, he said he spent days and weeks in a four foot by four foot by four foot cage underground, 
under the chicken coop where the chicken's droppings all fell on him for being a preacher and uh, smuggled Bibles and preached in underground churches all across the Middle, Middle East Muslim countries, leading people to Christ all the time. And, and the guy is a good-looking, sharp, intelligent young man who could have, he'd have come to America. If he'd have gone on a preaching tour in America just telling stories, he'd have been rich. Every church in America and every Christian radio station and TV station would have just flocked after him to let him tell his story. So that, you know what would have happened? He'd have no more stories to tell because he'd have quit doing what God called him to do. Why do you do that? Well, because God so loved the world. That's why we do it. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son and they killed him. Let's read on a couple more verses here and we'll be done. Verse 32, and we declare unto you glad tidings. That's the word, the gospel, the good news, how that this promise, which was made to the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. And it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son. He's quoting Psalms because these are Jewish people. And, uh, and they, they understand a lot of that Old Testament. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, no more to retain, no, uh, now no more to return to corruption. He said in this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And he's, he's quoting all this, look at verse 38. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. And, you know, this is, this is what these Flags and Missions Month is all about. Seven billion people. And from a prayer meeting, God begins to work. And he reaches out and grabs somebody and Actually, he grabbed the rest of the group and said, you guys send these two. And they go out to preach, and they face the devil, and they face attack, and then they go a little further, and they lose some of their party for a while. He comes back, is very well used and very important to the Apostle Paul later on. And then they go to a place, and, and what they're doing is they're trying to explain to these people, your religion is going to send you to hell. You need Jesus. Now, what's our part? Well, the question is, what, God, what does God want your part to be? We have continually asked God to call our young people to the mission field. But a lot of us just make money and send money, finance, right, Brother Nate? You don't need any money, right? I, I sent him a guy a letter. I said, what, we'd like to help you. What can we do for you? He says, I got everything taken care of. What kind of missionary is that? <laughs> what a... I just don't know if I've ever said those words. No, that's not true. But, uh, you know, we want a part of Nate and Tara's ministry in Chile. We want a part of John and Brittany in Thailand. Go and Danielle in, in uh, Tokyo or wherever they are, someplace I can't pronounce, in Japan. And uh, we, These young people going off on deputation during uh, Christmas week, Nate, uh, Nate Patton was here, and I got, the, the fir I got my first copy of a prayer card of Nathan and Marissa, missionaries of the Philippines. And, you know, what we, that, what we can do, we can pray for them and we can send money. Missions month is this. Pray, send money, send people. That's what it's all about. Because 7 billion people, if they don't meet Christ, they'll die and go to hell. It's not, and, I, and it's not about American politics, although I do love our country. But I, more, than, more important than our country is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're not sure you're going to heaven today, could I tell you, Christ died for you. If you know for sure you're saved, the very next step biblically is baptism. If you know you've been saved and baptized, the next step, get to know God. Read your Bible. Be in church. Be here every time the doors open. Uh, spend some time getting to know God. Look at your finances and ask God what you could do from your wallet to help his cause. And it might be, might be you're, you're going to be blessed and be able to do financial things. might be getting alone with God in prayer like those prayer meetings. We don't know anything what happened at that prayer meeting where at Mary's house, at John Mark's mother's house, except that Peter was released. Your, your time in prayer matters. I want to encourage you this year. Let's learn to pray. You don't learn to pray. Just show up and be there. Gathered in prayer. 
And let's look at our finances for God. And let's pray that God calls some people. Let's pray. Father, bless us as we go today. We thank you, Father, for the great privilege of getting the gospel to us, that we have heard the gospel. I don't know if there's a place in America that you couldn't find Christ if you really wanted to ask. Maybe there's some, but Lord, our country's got so many Bibles and so many churches, and, and we're very grateful for them. But we ask, Lord, for help that we would be faithful to pray and give and, and, uh, and seek your blessing, that there might be some who would go across the world to get the gospel to that 7 billion number that don't have the gospel. Help us. May our church be a part of the answer, please. Lord, we need you, and we need you to preserve us and preserve our nation that we might have liberty to do these things. Meet with us and speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's